I want to talk to you about my partner. Now, I call him Bigham. He's about five foot nine. Now, he weighs hundreds of pounds. And let's just face it, he's fat. They, uh, but he's healthy. You see, some people would say he's as healthy as a horse. Well, partially because he is one. You see, I get to ride him for a couple of hours every day. Now, this is like a childhood dream job. I get paid to put on a cowboy hat saddle up and ride for a couple hours every day. Now, I have to do some other things as well, like supervise offenders, but that's because I am a correctional officer. Now, when I'm seated high in that saddle, I'm a good nine feet off the ground, and it allows me to see things from a different perspective because it's not really a bird's eye view, but it allows me to see the vastness of everything. Now, it's not the men in white picking crops, and it's not the plants planted in those nice little rows. See, for me, it's hope and it's progress. Now, when you think of a prison, you probably don't think of hope, much less progress. You're probably thinking of prisoners, cells, maybe that guy that got locked up on the news last night. But when we look at prison, when is the last time we actually really thought about it, much less thought about something that goes on in it? You see, prisons are places of confinement where we send lawbreakers to. And for the most part, we never give them a second thought until for all the wrong reasons, something happens and then we read about it on the news or we see it on TV. Now, part of my job in corrections as a correctional officer is to reintegrate offenders into society. And with the justice system being as complex as it is, that's different for every offender. You see, we have to keep in mind, offenders are people. People have different interests and skills. And my department is in charge of agriculture, so we started to look at farming just a little bit differently. By doing that, we created a little bit of a spark. And that spark was something that's very simple. Most of us would not even think twice about it. It was something as simple as a salad. Now, all this started back in 2007. There was a kitchen captain in Texas at the Dale Hart unit. He was sick and tired of the food tasting bad, so he wanted to do something about it. So he decided to grow a little herb garden. Now, whatever your viewpoint is on criminal justice or offenders, it's important to remember that people are going to make mistakes. Some people are going to get incarcerated. When they're incarcerated, we have to feed them. To add to that, correctional staff eat the same thing the offenders do. So when the offenders are eating beans and cornbread, I'm eating beans and cornbread. I want the food to taste just a little bit better as much as they want it to. Now that unit ended up being audited. And the auditor smelled something good in the kitchen. Now, there's a lot of conversations in prison. But very rarely do you ever hear about people talking about how good the kitchen smells, <laughs> much less how tasty it is. And this is especially true when the auditor sees something he's never seen before, an herb garden. So it was explained to him that all that good smells from herbs, and we had an herb garden. So he let it go. See, there's nothing in the rules or regulations, much less the policies, that prevents you from having an herb garden in a prison. Well, word got out, and this was a no-brainer. Little herb garden started popping up all over Texas. And from that, Texans, like myself, love to brag. We all do. It's like Texas's best pastime. We were all bragging in prison that we had the best herbs. What's the way to settle this? How are you going to settle this? Who does have the best? We decided to have a little competition. That competition is named Herb Behind Bars. It's a friendly competition between the prisons in Texas to see who has the best. Now, in 2017, the unit I'm at, the Mark W. Michael unit, decided we were going to win. We were going to go for the gold, but we knew we needed to do something that put us over the top. Give us that little bit of an edge to really bring home that trophy. Now, my lieutenant did what any of us would do. He turned to Google. <laughs> and he typed in extreme gardening. Now, he came across a hydroponics video, and now this seemed like the solution. I mean, this would put us over the top. We just had to figure out how to do it. 
So anytime we find a solution to something, it seems we create a new problem. And we had two big issues. One, we had no money. And two, we really didn't have a clue on even how to get started. So we put our resources into a pile, and through a little bit of grit and determination, we came up with our first system. Now, this system was made from a bathtub, a pool pump, and some solo cups as left over from a party. <laughs> this wasn't pretty, but it worked. We had built a working system. Now, with this system, we knew we needed to learn a little bit more. And trial and error is great, but it's slow. And one of the first things we realized quick and right off the bat was that a bathtub makes a horrible water tank. So what we did is we took an IBC tote, one of those intermediate bulk containers, and we sank it into the ground. Then we capped it. Now I would love to tell you that we did this because of geothermal insulation and its positioning allows it to become a perfect sump tank. But we learned about that after the fact. See, that had tons of benefits. But I don't work with the nicest people in the world. I have to keep their safety and security in mind as well as my own. And every decision I make in these systems has to be around safety and security first and foremost. So we started to learn more about hydroponics. And by learning more about hydroponics, we realized that we were completely dependent on a chemical solution. You see, we started building a much better and productive system, but as we grew, that cost per plant increased because we were tethered. Now, in looking at more sustainable ways of doing things, we stumbled on something called aquaponics. Now, aquaponics is a type of hydroponics. Essentially, you're replacing that chemical or that nutrient solution with fish, specifically the liquid fish waste. Again, now we have a solution to a problem that creates a new problem. Our new problem now was how to keep fish alive. <laughs> so we started back at the beginning, trial and error. We started learning about water pumps and water filters and how important water is for the fish. And we started growing out catfish, and we got them when they were a couple of inches big, and we started developing them, and they started getting big. And we were so proud because we didn't have any crashes. The system was stable. It was working like a charm. And we finally got one catfish up to about five pounds. And, I mean, this was cool. We had a big catfish in our system. And I named it Dolly. And I came in one day, and I got off my saddle, and I checked my system every day. I just got in that habit, too. And Dolly was floating at the top. <laughs> And this hurt. I mean, this, I, we felt we had everything done right. So what am I to do? I told the lieutenant, we've got to find something. What's killing this fish off? So we loaded it up in the back of my car, and I drove it to the vet. <laughs> now, please keep in mind, I am in full uniform when I do this. <laughs> and I lay it across this poor veterinary assistant's desk, and I say, ma'am, I just need to know what killed it. And without missing a beat, she looks straight up at me with doe eyes and says, was it involved in a crime? <laughs> so, well, <laughs> so, well, homicide is obvious. I just need to figure out if it's me or nature. <laughs> They didn't really have a lot of answers, so I left my name and number, and then I went to the next veterinary clinic and the next one. About 11 of them later, I finally had almost completely given up hope. And then a professor from the University of Mississippi called me. He heard that a crazy cowboy lawman was driving around terrorizing these poor veterinary clinics, and he had to know what was going on. Well, I explained it to him. And he was like, that's awesome. You know, I'm willing to help you out. Just send it to me. I'll do a necropsy for free. I was like, that's awesome. What the hell is a necropsy? <laughs> it was like, well, it's an odd topsy for fish. Sweet. You're a fish CSI guy. Rock on. <laughs> FedEx, here I come. After a lot of testing, what ended up happening was we had had a lot of rain in the previous week, and it threw our system out of whack. Now, while we were able to actually fix our system and repair it, it stressed out the fish to the point that it died. Our fish died from being overstressed. So now we put up a tarp over the system every time we think it's going to rain. Problem solved, and we moved on to the next. 
Now, this was really big because I had never really thought of asking outsiders for help. When we were working in a prison, you work in a very confined area. So I started thinking, well, by networking, I'm able to learn a little bit more. Well, let me see if I can reach out and do some other things. So we started working with the University of Mississippi as well as Texas A&M University. They got on board and loved what we were doing and willing to help us out. Then we started working with professional organizations such as the Aquaponics Association. And with all this, we were learning more. And the more we learned, the more I kept on hearing my training captain in the back of my head. You see, I had a training captain named McCary, and he used to tell me, knowledge is power, but only if utilized to empower others. So with all we're learning, we need to be teaching somebody. Now, obviously, I need to be teaching offenders. I mean, they're working the system. They're helping us build it. They're helping us harvest it. It only makes sense that they learn a little bit of the science behind it. And what's better is these guys are falling from urban environments. They're not going to be having 20 acres to go farm when they get back. We need to be teaching them urban farming. It just makes sense. So that's exactly what we started to do. We developed workshops and curriculum. We started teaching offenders the basics of urban farming, agriculture, and these new technologies that we had really dipped our toes in but really started to develop. And that caught on. In fact, we even had some offenders try to transfer into our unit to learn this mystical art of growing fish and plants together. Well, those were really successful. And Texas decided to have us teach FM 4.01. Now, what that is, is it's a field force class, field force operations. These are the guys who wear the cowboy hats, ride the horses, and work in that agricultural setting. Well, to get them on board... We taught them after hours and gave them a crash course. And the way we explained it to them is this. Look, agriculture is changing. It always is changing. But we need to learn these new technologies to keep up. Now, these technologies produce more, and they're much more environmentally friendly. And not only that, we can actually make an impact, not only in our own facilities, but in the environment, which helps out the community, which helps out the population at large. They were ready to go. From there, we started teaching officers, and word quickly spread. You see, the agency started to really get behind us, and all these little aquaponics systems started popping up in prisons in and mixed Texas. And the Sustainability Prison Project found out about it, and they asked us a really simple question. What's your goal? What are you guys trying to do with this? Well, my first goal is not to kill fish. But when we started thinking about it, everybody was growing leafy greens and lettuce. Well, you make a salad with lettuce. So we asked ourselves, what difference can a salad make? If I was to produce one salad a week within the bars of the penitentiary, could that really change things? So that's exactly what we set that challenge out. We want to do one salad a week within the bars of the penitentiary. Make it sustainable and use that to teach other people how to do that. They really liked the idea. And they started sending word out to wardens all across the United States. We started getting emails. And the emails showed the interest, but we figured out real quick everybody was on our page, trial and error. The American Correctional Association then got on board and asked us to do a workshop so that we could teach prison agencies across the country on how to do this art of aquaponics. See, by networking, we learn more. And by learning more, we're able to do more. By doing more, the tangible results is a program that feeds people, saves money, and teaches offenders a job skill they can use when they get out to better help not only us, but the communities at large. Now, when I sit down to eat my simple yet awesome tasty salad, in the chow hall, I realized what can be done with just a little bit of grit and determination. You see, how something as small as a salad can be both the most challenging and rewarding experience of my life. And I have for you a simple question. What does your perspective look like? One of the biggest mistakes we think of is that our circumstances mitigate the amount of change we can make in the world around us. But you don't have to settle. You don't have to settle being an office worker or a student or a correctional officer. 
You are exactly where you need to be in life to make a change in the world. I simply challenge you to change your angle and look at your perspective. Thank you.